We're going to talk today out of John 15. If you have a Bible, you're welcome to open to John 15 or pull it up on your iPhone or iPad or Android or whatever you have. John 15, 1 through 8 will be our primary verses today. And I'm going to open my Bible so I'm there when I need it. Well, to start off, though, a, a quick story. I've heard this story told. Uh, it's a tale of an older woman who had just finished grocery shopping. And she returns out to her car in the parking lot, and as she approaches her car, she sees four guys sitting inside of her car. Now, she starts having things stir through her head. The crime rate in America had just, you know, she was disgusted, just angry about people taking advantage of people. And so she reaches into her little purse and pulls out a 38 special. Grandma's packing heat, right? She drops her bags, puts the gun to the window, and she says, I have a gun and I know how to use it. Get out of my car now. The guys all put their hands up, quickly exit the car. They don't need a second invitation. Doors are opening, bodies are flying out, and they just run like crazy. Because gun toting granny is frightening. Okay? Now, despite her Clint Eastwood impression, she was, she was shaken by the experience. She'd never actually, you know, threatened somebody before with a gun. She'd only shot it a couple of times in practice, and she got into her car, and she was just, you know, shaking, and got the bags into the car, and got the door closed, and was sitting there just a, a little overwhelmed by the experience, and she's still looking around, making sure none of these guys return, and she gets out her keys, and she's trying to, to, to put it in the ignition, trying to trying to get it to car, and she's keeping her eyes out for these hoodlums, and why isn't this key working, she's thinking to herself. This is my trembling hands, because, you know, the adrenaline of the moment, and then she just can't get the key to go in the car, right? And she starts looking more closely at this car. All of a sudden, she realizes about four spaces over is an identical car. And she realized at that moment, she had just become part of the crime wave that was gripping America. <laughs> So according to the story, she transfers all the groceries out of this car to her own car and drives herself to the police station and turns herself in. <laughs> now, now the desk sergeant who takes this story, tears are streaming. He falls off his chair. He's laughing so hard. And all he does is he points to the end of the counter because there stands four guys filing a report of getting carjacked by a little old lady. <laughs> And she made an apology, they accepted it, nobody went to jail, thankfully. But the lesson of the story is, know what you own, right? Be prepared to be embarrassed if you don't. So let's uh, read John 15 in light of that little bit of humor, and think this through together. John 15, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 8, I guess, to get us started. It says, I am the vine, or I am the true vine. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, it says in verse 4, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into a fire and burned. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so, and so prove to be my disciples. So reads the words of Jesus. Well, the first thing I want you to hear as we read through this passage, and talking about this ownership issue a moment ago, is that the, vi the vineyard, the vineyard, belongs to God, Right? As we read this passage, the vineyard Jesus is talking about is a metaphorical vineyard, but it's the vineyard of God. And there's no mistaking this principle. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And at the beginning of this passage, he says, I am the true vine. And it's my father who is the gardener. My father is the vine dresser. He is the owner of the vineyard. Now, I have a, a six-year-old son. Some of you have met their 
there, my wife and son and in-laws are at home getting ready for everybody to come this afternoon to unpack stuff. And, and parenting is a humbling experience, as those of us who are parenting know. Um, we learn quickly that we don't have to teach our children to be sinners, right? Um, they, 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 my son, I didn't have to teach my son how to be naughty. And one of the things that young children quickly learn, one of the very first things, in fact, they learn as a social interaction, unfortunately but true, is often selfishness, right? Mine! You ever heard those words from a toddler? No! Right? They, they want to be the boss. They want to have their way. They want to, they want to be in charge. I mean, have you ever been amazed by a toddler that latched onto something, even irrational something? You know, a, a, a plastic butter tub, right? You were going to put dinner leftovers in the plastic... I can't believe it's not butter tub. You set it on the table, the toddler walks up, toddler grabs it, and now it's mine! Despite your desire to put leftover spaghetti in it. And you try to take that away, you're going to have a fight, Right? Those of us who are parents have been down that road many times. And it doesn't matter what that thing is. It could be a plastic butter tub, or it could be a beautiful piece of crystal that the child grabs. The child doesn't care about its actual value. The child doesn't know anything about its actual value. My little guy just knows he got his grubby hands on it, and now it's mine. That selfishness is within us. And once our hands get on something, oftentimes we don't like to let it go. But how ridiculous is that? Now, of course, children can't comprehend the value of things. They don't understand how hard somebody worked on something. If it was a, a precious piece of art glass, they, they don't understand the, the hours it learned into the techniques and how to get the fire just right and to melt the glass and mold and shape the bowl and all that kind of stuff. They don't understand that. They also don't understand poly injection molding that <laughs> creates a, I can't believe it's not butter thing, like a million of them in 10 minutes, right? They, they, they can't differentiate that. They don't understand it. But they do immediately understand this idea of possession. They get it. They have it. It's mine. Now, I wish I could say we grow out of that, but sometimes, oftentimes maybe, we don't. We don't just grow out of it because we're older than three. Now, by the time a person's 30 or 50 or 70 or 90, we've often had a chance in our lives at some point in time to look up to heaven, look up to God, shake our tiny little fist at God and say, but God, it was mine, right? Right? You ever done that? Maybe not in those very words, but... But God, it was my good health, right? I want it back. I don't want this disease, Lord. I'm tired of the way I feel. I'm scared of the surgery. I'm sick of the treatments. It's not fair that it costs this much. God, it was my health. It was mine, right? But God, I earned that money. Why did the stock market have to go down? Why did my house have to lose value? That was my retirement. It was mine. It was mine, God. Right? But God, says the man who was standing by the fresh grave, she was mine. But God, says the mother, who's looking at the empty room of her 18-year-old son who's just moved out to college, he was just a little boy not too long ago. And I liked him that way because he was mine. But God, says the young adult, this was my future. I had it all planned out. I had it all worked out. I had it all figured out. I knew where I was going to school. I knew what promotions I was going to work on. I didn't want to change directions midstream. God, that future was mine. But God, says the church member, I gave years of my life to that church. I gave thousands of dollars to that church. More sweat than you could ever carry in a bucket. Now it's not what it once was. God, that was my church. And I want it back. Right? 
Some of these hit close to home sometimes. But God, in his infinite righteousness and wisdom, sometimes tells us no. Doesn't he? Does a toddler like to hear no? Mm -mm, they sure don't. The two-year-old in all of us doesn't like to hear no. But the truth of the matter was, none of it was actually ours to begin with. It was all God's. The money wasn't ours, the time wasn't ours, the child wasn't ours, the spouse wasn't ours, the job wasn't ours. They were all gifts from God. We were getting to use it. We might have kind of had some possession of it. But in actuality, it wasn't mine. Now from the very moment that God issued his Ten Commandments to us, God told us up front that he is a jealous God. That he would tolerate no other gods. That he would never relinquish his right to be the God of our lives. And in the vineyard, we find another opportunity here to realize that it is God who is actually in control. God is in charge, and we are not. Sometimes that can be frustrating. But we cannot find our purpose without realizing what our place is in that order. Now obviously, if you've gardened before, I've gardened. I, I'm not a great gardener, but I've had some success over my years, particularly with flowers for whatever reason. Um, in a garden, the branch doesn't tell the vine what to do, does it? And on a farm, the plants, they don't tell the farmer how to get the job done. Can you imagine a plant telling a gardener, no, we're not doing it that way, we're going to do it this way, right? The orchid in my office doesn't give me feedback when I do or don't water it, when I do or don't fertilize it, when I do or don't put it in the sunlight. The orchid just is an orchid and it does its thing. It allows me to make the decisions. A good plant simply trusts the gardener. Largely, it does have no choice. And there may be no harder principle for us to put into practice for, for those of us who are believers than this very first one. Because whether we like to admit it or not, most all of us, probably all of us, we're control freaks. We want to be in control. I want to be the boss. I want to be the one calling the shots. I want to be the one making the decisions. No, God, it's mine. Right? We feel better when we're in control. If there are four adults riding in a car, three of them are probably thinking they should be driving. <laughs> and there is one driving, so you can do that math. Right? And when it comes to this spiritual notion of bearing fruit, the bad news is that God demands we release control. There is no other option, in fact. You and I have no more right to tell God how to do His business than the tree outside has telling me how it should grow. It doesn't work that way. So that's the bad news today, folks. You've got to give up control. But there's good news, too. The good news, and this is great news in fact, the good news, if you're not in control, that means you don't have to carry the weight, you don't have to carry the burden of being in control. Your job, the Bible says, is simply bear fruit. And God wants us to bear as much fruit as possible in our lives. And that's impossible to miss throughout Scripture. Our job is to bear fruit. And of the major application points in the lesson that Jesus was giving to those who were listening to him that day, this one is overwhelmingly simple. Our purpose is to bear fruit. And the mission of our life is to discover how we are going to go about that process. Now the sermon today is an excellent opportunity for you to ask this question if you've never asked it before. 
God, why was I born? What is my purpose? It's a great chance for us to think about that and re-examine why it is God has placed us here. For some reason, God put us here in this church this morning, in this community, in this town, in this county, in this state, in this country. Why, God? Why was I put here? Why am I not in Abu Dhabi? Why am I not in Rio or Sri Lanka or Alaska or Antarctica? Well, nobody lives there really. But why? God, why was I born? And then, if you haven't asked that question, pursue it. Seek out why it is God has put you here at this place and at this time. It's not by accident, folks. And the reason is because God wants us to bear fruit all through our lives. So we need to figure out why it is we're here. So we can bear the fruit He wants us to bear. Now sometimes, as we talk about bearing fruit, there's a misunderstanding by some. They think this bearing fruit idea is an evangelism idea, right? How many, how many people have you led to Christ? That's bearing fruit, right? Well, yes, it is. We, we want to be leading people to Christ. We want to be bearing fruit in that category. But bearing fruit is a broader thing than simply the number of individuals we may or may not have led to Christ. It's more than even the number of people we've baptized. If, if, if our only victory as Christians, if the only fruit that we can celebrate is the number of people we lead to Christ or the number of people we baptize, we're not going to have a whole lot of celebration then, are we? Relatively. So there's got to be more to it than that. And everyone in every church plays a role of bearing fruit. Exercising the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given us. The gifts that God has given us so that we can fully become the follower of Christ He created us to be. So people with the gift of evangelism, their gifts are to be used for evangelistic fruit. But people who are gifted in teaching, use your gifts there and teach others that they may grow in their faith. Or how about those with the gift of hospitality? I really like those people. They like to cook. They like to have me over. I love those people. Right? If you've got the gift of hospitality, you have a tremendous inroad for evangelism. You may not be a gifted evangelist, but if you can cook and you can invite people over, you'll get a chance to tell somebody about Jesus if you do it often enough. Right? How about those who work with small children? Some people are incredibly gifted working with kids. I see them and I go, man, you know, I, I can work with kids, but I'm not gifted at it. So I'm like 20 minutes in, fried. Mostly because of the noise level. I don't have a high noise level tolerance. And the noise just is exponential as you add more kids. So the more kids, the more noise, the quicker I get worn out. Like I go and serve in my son's school. I used to go to his kindergarten class. I'd serve for an hour a week. I couldn't do more than an hour a week with 20 kindergarten kids. I have the most amazing understanding of how awesome his teacher is after just an hour a week in his classroom. It's like, praise the Lord, you've created people who can do this for eight hours a day, five days a week, for 40 years, which was his kindergarten teacher. If that's your gifting, use it. Because bearing fruit is more broad than simply how many people have you led to Jesus? How many kids have you loved? How many people have you served? How many people have you invited to your home for dinner? Yes, how many people have you led to the Lord? How many people have you baptized? That's part of the equation too. But it's all that and then some, right? Because God has given us all sorts of different gifts and tools to use in His service. And it's important for us to use the tools that He's given us. Can I use 
a wrench as a hammer? Well, yeah. But is it going to do a good job? No. It's probably going to eventually break that wrench if I do it too much. But the hammer can just keep on hammering. Nail after nail after nail after nail. Using the right tool is important. So use the tools God has given us. Now there's a, a story told of a Stanford University professor who did a study on this subject. And this university professor went out and, and hired a logger. Somebody who did the really, really hard logging where you've got to climb into the really dangerous places and chop trees down by hand so that they can get the big machinery in. And so she hired this logger and says, I will pay you double what they pay you at your work site just to come to work for me for a little while. And the guy's like, all right, yeah, sure. I can do that. But she said, here's the deal though. When you come, bring your axe, and all day long, you have to use the back side of your axe to chop wood. You cannot use the sharp side of your axe. The guy thought she was a little batty, but twice the money, what the heck? It's the same number of swings. She says, I'll sit there all day and pound on your wood. Punk, punk. He thought he was getting a good deal. But by lunchtime, he quit. The money was great. The job environment was just fine. Why did he quit, she asked him. He said, I couldn't stand it. He said, every time I swing my axe in a job site, ching, ching, chunks of wood go flying. I see the results of my work. But today, I'm just smacking on a log and it's, nothing's happening and it's, nothing's going on. And if I don't see the chips fly, it's no fun and I'm not motivated to do what it is I'm gifted at doing. So I quit. And it's kind of that way with our gifts from the Holy Spirit. If we don't take and use those gifts that God has given us, if we don't start to see some benefit and some fruit from that, we begin to get frustrated. We begin to lose interest. We'll put the axe down and we'll quit chopping. And all that talent, that, all that gifting that God has given, then simply goes to waste. So use the gifts that God has given you. And if you're hearing me today, and I'm still fairly new as your pastor, and you don't know what your spiritual gifts are, come talk with me. I'd love to talk with you. I'd love to sit down with you. I'd love to resource you with some tools to help you identify what is your spiritual gifting. And many of us have multiple gifts. You might have gifts you don't even know about. I didn't know a long time ago that I was gifted to preach. In fact, I never was on my radar. When I started at my church, in First Congregational Church in Waseca, eight and a half years ago or something like that, the single biggest worry that my wife expressed to me in my taking that job, she said to me, are you sure you could preach? <laughs> I had never had to preach every week. Never done it. And I had the same fear as she did. I said, well, I guess we'll find out. Yeah, I'm still going, so I guess it's okay. But all of us are given unique gifts and all of us have been brought here at this place, at this time, to this church. God has equipped this church with what this church needs to reach this community. I fully believe that. It's just a matter of will we leverage our gifts? Will we get into the game? Will we use what God has given us? We don't need to copy somebody else's work. Our gifts aren't the same. We need to do what God has uniquely created us to do. If we're not an oak, we don't need to grow like an oak. If we're a rose, grow like a rose. Or am I rose? It's my last name, if you don't know. Because otherwise we will be frustrated like that logger. If we don't do what we were created to do, what we were gifted to do, what we are talented to do, we're going to feel like we've been hitting the blunt end of the axe against the wood all day. Consider the fruits of the Spirit from Galatians 5, 22-23. You've heard these before. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, and self-control, right? 
when you pull those things off, when you're living out in love and, and you're being gracious, and when, when you express patience and peace and joy and gentleness and kindness, you are exhibiting the way that God has gifted you. And right next to this very same garden, Jesus said the very words where he says, love one another, right? That's part of it too. And in fact, that happens to be the very first of the list of the spiritual gifts. Love. So maybe as you're wondering, well, what are my spiritual gifts? I guarantee you, your spiritual gift is to love. Love others as Christ first loved you. Serve others as Christ first served you. And if you do that, you have a pretty good start in the game. And we'll figure out the rest as we go along the way. Love others, serve others, and exercise the gifts God has given you. Titus 3.14 says this, And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works, so as to help cases of urgent need, and not to be unfruitful. Psalm 1.3 says this, He, the, the righteous man, is like a tree planted, planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Do you realize the joy in this? Every action, every attitude, all that we do can be a good work. All that we can do can be done to the glory of God. Every gift we've been given, every day that we draw breath, can be used to return to God that which has been loaned to us. But bearing fruit fully, as God has intended for us to do, requires some commitment on our part. It requires some work. It requires some discipline. Because we don't get good at something without that. I didn't just show up at college having never played football before and end up with a position on the team. It took lots of years of practice. I didn't get good at playing basketball without lots of years of practice. You don't get good at singing without practice. You don't get good at woodworking without practice. And woodworking is an excellent example because it also requires the right tools. I've tried woodworking before. I don't have the right tools. I don't think I have the right skills because boy, it was ugly. I can't even make a square table. Like, I can't make it square, let alone a table. And that's kind of key to making furniture work. I've tried. I'm just not that good. It's not my gifting. I'm not interested in it either, so that's okay. But if you want to be a good gardener, you've got to learn a little bit. You've got to practice a little bit. You want to be a good farmer? Same deal. You want to be a good auto mechanic? You want to be a good teacher? Anything in this life requires... For us to be good requires us to be dedicated, to work at it, to be disciplined in it, to be intentional about it. So each of us has to look at ourselves a little introspectively and say, Lord, how have you gifted me? What fruit should I bear? If you're not a banana tree, don't try to grow bananas. The apple tree doesn't look at the pear and say, why am I not growing pears? No. It says, I'm going to grow the best apples I can. That's what it does. That's what it was created to do. So we have to be intentional and focused about that. Now think of the object lesson that Jesus used here. I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit and wrap us up here. Jesus uses this example and he says, you are the vine. Or I am the vine. You are the branches. Your job is simply to bear fruit. Hold on to me. Where does the branch get its power? Where does the branch get its nourishment? Where does the branch get everything it needs? From the vine. 
And that vine is caretaken by the vine dresser. God is watching over us, making sure we have what we need if we are willing just to take it and use it to His glory. Produce fruit. God has called all of us and God has equipped all of us. If you find yourself exhausted with what you're doing in life, if you find you're running out of passion and joy and energy every day in life, you may need to re-examine how it is you're gifted because you may very well be working with the wrong tools. You may have some other tools in the toolbox that God has given you and called you to use. So get the right tools out and work in the right direction. And God can do amazing things. God wants us to produce fruit naturally. And He's already given us all that we need to do it. Close with a story here. A man by the name of Danny Simpson was living in Ottawa, Canada. The year was 1990, and Danny was desperate. He was flat broke. He didn't have the resources he needed to survive. In fact, he was going to lose his house. And he was worried when he lost his house, he was going to lose his family. He was short on cash and he was short on skills. He'd run out of what he thought were all of the options in the world. And so he took out a gun that he owned, a gun that had been handed down to him through a couple of generations of his family. And he went down to the local bank and he robbed it of $6,000. Now the problem was, Danny wasn't a very good bank robber. So he was promptly arrested and in that, two significant things happened. First, Danny was sentenced to six years of prison. So there's no way he's going to be available to fix all the problems he was hoping to fix by robbing the bank. And not only that, when that comes is when you get arrested and put in prison, your opportunities in life just plummet. Your chance for success is greatly reduced. But the second thing that came out of this story was as they were examining him and looking at the evidence in the court case, somebody started looking closely at the gun that he used to rob the bank. And as they looked at that gun, they came to realize it was a, a, a Colt 45. It was a semi-automatic one made in 1918. And that gun, at the moment, was worth about $100,000. You see, Danny already had the tool that he needed. He had already been equipped. It was in his hands, in fact. But he didn't see what he had. And he used the tool that he had for the wrong purpose. God will not ask you to bear a kind of fruit that he's not gifted you to bear. He will equip you to bear the fruit that he's calling you to bear. God has given us His Word and through the Bible, that ultimate resource, we are equipped to do what He has called us to do. We've got what we need if we will just take it and use it. What we really need to do is trust God. And go back to that very first principle. Because it's not about us, Jesus says. It's about Him. He is the vine, not you. We're just a branch. Our Father in Heaven is the owner of it all, not us. He'll make the gardening decisions. He'll do the pruning. He will call the shots. That's right. It's His right and not ours. He's in control. So as we go out this week, go out encouraged with the faith that God has equipped you to do great things. And he expects us, in fact, to do great things to his glory with all that he has given us. Amen.